I'm going to let all these students in and I'll continue to let them in as well. And you'll see here they are. Hello. We will continue to let students in as they join us. Um, hello, students. We're glad to see you all. Um, you are welcome to um, have your videos on, off, whatever works for, me, for you. I know some of you um, are, you know, kind of joining us from spaces on campus where it's not great to have your videos on in between classes. Um, but if you want to share your, your faces, you are welcome to do so. Um, I'll give a couple more minutes for people to join us and then we will begin with Dawn and others um, can continue to join as they arrive. Um, um, I will do um, very little by way of introduction of Dawn because I will let her introduce herself, but I will share a little, I know you all read her bio, um, but to begin, I'm Destiny Barletta. I'm um, the Director for Alumni Connections um, in our career education team. And some of you students may not know, um, but you will in the future, that Wellesley is um, somewhat unique in terms of our career education group in that Wellesley Career Ed is a lifetime service for you all. So you have access to all of the programming and advising and offering and platforms that Career Ed offers, obviously, while you're a student. Um, and we hope to see a lot of you in the coming years. Um, but all of that access does not end when you graduate, um, including direct one-on-one -on -one advising, group advising, cohort programming, and access to the tech platforms that Career Ed offers, including the Hive and Handshake. Um, so Career Ed is here to partner with you um, around your career pathway for the duration and even into retirement. We have a great conversation with, with alums about their retirement, which seems like a very long way away, but truly a life. Um, so we are so fortunate to have Dawn here with us. Um, Dawn is from the class of 95, which was like basically yesterday. Um, yeah. And <laughs> she is um, going to talk with you all today about entrepreneurship, about branding, about her career um, working in kind of large companies and small startups and what happened with some of those startups. Um, she has an interesting career um, and a lot of experience in new product development, branding, marketing more kind of broadly. Um, she worked for a period of time at Goldman Sachs, um, at Fortune. Um, fast company magazines. She has been involved with the kind of starting and then the evolution of several companies throughout her career um, and currently runs her own branding company, which is called Two Cents Riot, um, which focuses on product naming and startup consulting, which is very interesting. And I'm so eager to hear more about that. Um, she lives in New York um, with her family. And when she was at Wellesley, she was an American studies major and she might also probably share some about how that has impacted the work that she has done. Um, so I will turn it over to Dawn. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hello. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, love Wellesley and always excited to show up. So I am going to go um, sort of through my, what I would call a very non-traditional career path. Um, and uh, hopefully the you know, find something that is relevant to take away from there. And I'm super open for questions. Um, and yeah, let's just get into it. So um, make sure my thing advances. So I graduated, as Destiny said, in the 1900s, as my kids always say, like, you graduated college in 1995, to be exact. Um, here's some pictures of me from Wellesley and then from my 20 year reunion. Um, still friends with the same people, um, my freshman roommates and the people I lived with. Um, I lived in Kaz, Severance, McAfee and Palm. I feel like people always want to know that. Um, when I was at Wellesley, some of the things that are actually kind of formative that I did was I was the uh, I was in college government. I was chief justice. Um, so I was in Gen Judish and then I was the chief justice. And my name is still somewhere on one of the um, walls 
now probably buy a bathroom somewhere, but um, I was uh, the president of Wellesley Women for Choice, which was a great experience for me. I actually got arrest uh, arrested when Operation Rescue was hitting Boston and bombing clinics at that time. I don't have a record though. Um, I was a tour guide uh, and worked in the admissions office for all four years and was a reader on the board of admission. And I had a very ill-flated flirtation with rugby during my freshman year. Um, and uh, the BC girls were really mean and I was not very good. Um, so that was my time at Wellesley. As uh, Destiny said, I live in New York now uh, with my two daughters who are sophomore, uh, a sophomore and a senior. Um, and I met my husband in college, he went to MIT. So um, we have a, a lot of Wellesley MIT friends from that time. Um, this is just some of the like highlights when people talk about like street cred, I feel it's one of the things I'm going to talk about. You have to have like sort of done something so you can talk about what you did. Um, these are some of my wins. I have probably more failures than I do wins in my career, but, um, there's a couple, uh, things that I'm really, really proud of. I was a time magazine best invention winner in 2014 for a line of action figures. I co-created, um, I was a vice president at Goldman Sachs. I worked in the office of the chairman, which was a really big deal. Um, I was a director at fast company magazine and founded our award-winning event, uh, department, um, and uh, I was director of uh, uh, Fortune. Um, I have founded three companies. Um, I am Elemental, which we launched in Kickstarter and we were fully funded in two days and we were close to 500% overfunded. Um, and have, I've been featured in a lot of magazines and on TV and um, stuff like that. So um, I just like to share that. So I do have some street cred under my belt and that has given me the opportunity to do a lot of interesting things, but let's, like what I wanted to share was sort of how does that all evolve? Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a nonlinear career in business. So I've worked in a bunch of aspects of business, primarily publishing, marketing, and entrepreneurship. Um, I'm going to share some of the lessons I've learned along the way and a little bit of food for thought as you enter your career journey, particularly if you're thinking about business, marketing, branding, that sort of thing. What I'm not going to offer is sort of tidy boxes and straight lines. I have no hard and fast formula for success um, and there's no rules. So those are uh, my yeses and nos for today. This is my bio um, from a very straightforward perspective. So this is, if you were going to go chronologically, what I did, what my titles were, that is it. I graduated from Wellesley. I was an associate. I was an associate. I was a director. I was a VP. I was a director. I was a street advisor. Blah, blah, blah. That's my career. Um, I went. I graduated from Wellesley. If we start that at point A and today's point B, where I'm doing a Wellesley career presentation. So what does it look like to get from point A to point B? This is what it looks like. This is my career. And I had so much fun putting this together. Um, and a couple of the things that are really, um, like interesting to think about, and I'm going to just, I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to go through every little bit, but if you go like sort of back to this straight line, this is really how a career evolves over 30 years. So I, when I was 20 years old, when I graduated from Wellesley, I was a little young, um, I am 50 now I've been working for 30 years. Um, along the way, I've had those kind of career highs, but also a lot of my things that I've done are intermingled, which is why I did all of these lines. So a couple of things I'm going to talk about is the intermingling of people. So the yellow dots are where I met a person and the person led me on to another Wait, well, Sorry, the yellow dots are, um, like life experiences and the blue dots are people. And then there's a purple line that is like a, what I would call sort of extracurricular and passion. All of those things combine to create a career tapestry. Because really it's a tapestry, right? It's an interwoven collection of experiences that together when you're very, very close doesn't look like anything, but when you step back, the full picture appears. Um, and I'm going to just say, I'm going to do a couple of highlights because that's what they uh, asked me to do. So when I graduated from Wellesley, I had, I was an American studies major with a history concentration. Um, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was not in the position of not working for money. So I needed to fully support myself with no 
financial support from my family, which meant that my starting salary was incredibly important to me. So while I was like sort of interested in maybe going to work in like um, politics or in journalism or something, the starting salaries there were really low. So I went for the highest starting salary I could find, which at the time was management consulting. And I don't know if they still do this, but at that time, there were consulting companies that would come on campus and interview you and you got a job offer and it was like pretty straightforward. I started at this place called Renaissance Solutions, which is no longer around. And I started with five Wellesley classmates. So five women, we all started at the same time. I am still, I actually just talked to one of the women like 30 minutes ago, a woman named Sarah Leslie, who um, we, we were friendly at Wellesley, but we weren't friends. We became good friends working at this company and we started a co-mentorship relationship that has lasted for 30 years. And co-mentorship means um, every couple of weeks, and we've had big gaps where we don't do this, but she and I are both self-employed. And one of the things that happens when you're self-employed is you don't have a boss and you don't get a performance review and you don't have coworkers as much. So when you're trying to think through something. You don't have somebody to think it through with. So she um, and I sort of organically evolved into this co-mentor relationship. We actually wrote an article about it in Fast Company Magazine together about the secrets to being a co-mentor. Um, and what that is, we just regularly talk 30 minutes every three weeks and we basically talk about work. Um, we're in similar fields, but we're non-competitive. And so it'll be like, I got this issue with this client. What do you think I should price this contract? At? That's the stuff we talk about now, but in our careers, we've talked about different things. So that's just, and I didn't even put her on here, but that's a yellow, that's a connection that would go from the time I graduated Wellesley all to now. Many, many times she has referred me business and vice versa. We've collaborated on projects together. Um, we have uh, written articles together. And so it's been a very significant business relationship for me, but not one that is really defined anywhere. But I think I consider those types of relationships to be incredibly important to a long lasting, vibrant career. Um, from, from Renaissance, I actually, while I was at Renaissance, there was a very senior partner who's this guy named Gresh Breebach. He's there. And he was leaving. Oh, and I got transferred to London at one point, which was another interesting Me Too movement, which I'm not even going to digress on. But they told me that I couldn't get, I, I had very long hair at the time. And they said, you have to cut your hair to get the job. But um, which like today, nobody would ever do. Um, but I cut my hair and I got the job. And um, I met this guy and he was starting another company, which is called Next Era. And I went there. So that was the very first time in my career where I followed a person, not a job, where this like senior boss who I liked and respected was doing something and said, hey, I'm doing this thing. Do you want to come along with me? And I did that. And that sort of started out something throughout my entire career where I would sort of follow a person, not necessarily a job. Um, another significant time when that happened was when I was at Goldman Sachs, um, I met a woman named Jackie Zayner, who was my boss at the time. And actually it happened twice, two or three times with Jackie. Um, I was recruited to Goldman from Fast Company because they I was leading the events department at Fast Company at the time and Goldman wanted to do something similar. So they approached me and said, would you come do this for us? And it was my first time in my career I'd ever been recruited and I was like really excited. And um, Goldman's a really uh, well-respected firm. And I said, sure. And um what was interesting about that is that gave me an opportunity to move inside a very big company and get a perspective of sort of a big firm. Um, but when I was there, I met this, this female partner named Jackie and um, she, I was doing the job they recruited me for. I met her at a company function. We hit it off. She liked me so much. She recruited me to the chairman's office because she was the only woman in the office of the chairman. Goldman is a billion dollar company, like multi-billion that spans the, the 
world, they run the office of the chairman like the West Wing. Every partner runs an area of the firm. And I got recruited by her to join her. So I left the job I was in to follow her inside the same company and do this job, uh, a different job. And then she decided to leave Goldman. And she said, hey, will you come with me and run my family foundation? Because Jackie at the time was the youngest woman ever to make partner at Goldman. And um, then Goldman went public. So they had what they call in the industry, a wealth event. And she had all this money and was setting up a finally family foundation and wanted somebody to help her run this family foundation. And I didn't love Goldman because it was very, very structured. It was very big. They, they were very, like I had to wear pantyhose and they like had rules about everything. It just wasn't super creative. And so I was like, yeah, I'll go with you. And so I left and went with her. Um, so that's, that's another time I sort of followed someone to a job and decided to leave where I'm following the person, not the job. Um, the other thing that's sort of happening in the background to all of this is when I was at Wellesley, I learned self-defense. I took a self-defense class and I, I was hooked. And as I was uh, through all my career, I kept studying on the side. So at this time I was doing sort of kickboxing. Um, around the time I left around Goldman, I started training for actual regular boxing here in New York. And I contemplated doing the Golden Gloves, which is like a bit, this was, I was young. And um, this was a big deal. I ended up having a, a like a exhibition match with this woman who ended up, she went on to win the Golden Gloves and she beat the living shit out of me. And I was like, oh, oh, I'm not gonna do the Golden Gloves. Um, but I stayed interested in uh, self-defense and I began to kind of hone my craft in another way. And that's important for something that happens later in my career. There's a lot of strands, right? That are already working as you go along. So um, the other things that happened is, so after between, I was working with Jackie in this family foundation. I learned a lot about philanthropy, um, giving, I learned about like the grantor grantee relationship and a lot of stuff that sort of has continued to fuel some of my passion projects and some, some of my other work. Um, but I also, it was also sort of like a startup because she was starting the foundation. We had to put structure in place and, or, and come up with sort of a mission and a vision and operating principles and figuring out how we were going to work. And it was also very small. It was just the two of us. Um, but we would work with organizations that she was donating money to. So it was, again, it was, there were a couple things that were happening about the way of working that I was learning about myself. Um, so that was important. Then, um, Something else like 9-11 happened. And these are things that you just can't plan for. And New York was just a disaster. I lived one block north of where they shut it down. My husband was in the tower next door to it. He's fine. And um, it really rocked our world. And I decided I no longer wanted to work alone by myself in my apartment. And I really wanted to be back inside a company. And that's when I went to Fortune. And there's a connection there because when I was at Fast Company, I met a guy named Jerry Coughlin. And Jerry was the one who called me up and was like, hey, Fortune is hiring people. Do you want to go? And I was like, actually, like, yeah, I really do want to go. So I like the connections just keep going. And when I was at Fortune, I met somebody that then I left and just decided to do my own thing because I was thinking about having a baby. And I wanted uh, at Fortune, I had to travel like every week and I couldn't maintain the travel and have a baby. So I decided to go out on my own. And that was a huge shift in my career when I decided I was going to leave corporate America and go out on my own. And that started a whole, the rest of my career has been sort of startups and um, working for myself and um, kind of create, you know, founding things or working with small startups. Um, and along this time, the reason I'm gonna circle back to the self-defense stuff is I learned and I got certified to teach Krav, Krav Maga, which is an is Israeli form of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I was the first woman in the United States that the Israeli Krav Maga Association certified to teach. And I trained with the head of Krav Maga from the Israeli army. And the reason that's important is because this was an incredibly intensive, significant, personal endeavor that then turned out to influence my professional world because I, at that time, 
created a line of action figures for girls uh, with another Wellesley woman, a woman named Julie Kerwin. And um, we met after uh, in the neighborhood because we both had kids at the same age. And that, um, because of my sort of involvement in that, it, it sort of influenced my, um, uh, my just my thought process and what I was thinking about. And we created this line of action figures with a better breast to hip ratio and that were body positive and uh, weren't overly sexualized. And it was like a whole big thing. And um, through doing that, I really realized I liked startups and went on to do a couple more um, and founded a, a big and continued to then speak on personal safety and self-defense. And that's been a sort of underlying secondary career I would almost put on top of the other career. Um, so I'm going to move on uh, and talk about like what all what does this Michigas really mean? And the reason I so show all of those interconnected webs is because the thing I think is super important about um, careers, particularly careers in business more so because they're a little less straightforward, is something that I call finding your warp thread. Um, in tapestry, there's something called the warp thread. And the warp thread is the, the single thread that gives a piece its structure and definition. It's not always visible to the naked eye, but it's always there. And so what I like to say is like, think about your warp thread. And so you might look at somebody's career and it just looks like a multicolored, you know, strand uh, coat of many colors. But when you step back from it, it can take whatever shape you want. This would be mine. I'm the monkey, um, always in the middle of the thing. But you, your warp thread, I, you could take these same colored strands and create a million different tapestries, right? Maybe yours looks like this. Maybe yours looks like this. Maybe it's all one color, but with slightly different patterns. So maybe you're going to double down in one specific company or industry, but your career is still going to have a texture and a structure and a pattern to it. So I think the thing that's important is beginning to tease out your warp thread. And like, that's the, the sort of um, essence of who you are as a working person. And so here's some of the things I've learned about finding your warp thread. Um, it's really okay to follow people and not jobs. If I hadn't followed Gresh, if I hadn't followed Jackie, if I hadn't sort of, actually my current business partner now I met doing something else, like every time I've sort of followed a person, not a job, it's really turned out great for me because um, there's an industry sort of, or something my old boss used to say, which is like hire for attitude, train for skill. Like you want to work with people that you like, that you know, that are going to bring the best out of you. So I would really think about that. And a, a long career is a tapestry of people. So these are just all the yellow dots are jobs I got directly as a result of a connection I made at another job, right? So it's only one job did I get, which is um, when I moved to Fast Company, I got sort of not through a direct connection, um, but I did get it through a connection of a person. I got it because I was unhappy working in consulting and finance because I didn't like spreadsheets and acquisitions and it was just so boring. And I was reading Fast Company magazine at the time. It had only put out a couple of issues. Um, and there was a career counselor who wrote an article and he happened to be based in Boston. And I reached out to him and asked him if I could do a career session with him. And we had this career session. He introduced me to um, someone at, he knew at Fast Company because they'd written an article about him and I got an interview there. And that sort of brought me to Fast Company. So it would, would really be through a personal connection, but it's because I sort of took the initiative and like went out and, and met someone. The other thing I'll say is don't be afraid to go back to go forward. So that fast company job that I took, and remember I mentioned back at the beginning, the reason I went into consulting in the first place was because I, I really needed to be able to pay all my bills myself. And um, so for me, salary was something I had to think about. Um, to take that job at fast company, I caught, I cut my salary down by um, down to a third of what I was making. So at the time, and I looked back at this because this, I don't, uh, when I left Wellesley, my first job, I made $38,000 a year. And when I was at Next Era, I was like, down, I was up in the, in the mid sixties, which was a lot of money at the time for me. I was just a couple of years out of school. It was really nice. 
I, I got offered a job at like $20,000 to go to Fast Company. And they were basically like, it was like the Princess Bride, the Dread Pirates Roberts. My boss was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. I may have to fire you, but I mean, I'll pay you. And like, if you do good, we'll try and get you more money. And I took the risk and I cut my salary down. And it was the single best decision I ever made in my entire career. They got me back up to my current salary in, in the salary I was making in under a year. And I was number 20 of the fastest growing magazine uh, of all time at that time. And I rode that ride all the way through and it propelled me forward in my career in ways I could never have imagined. And I made some of my very best friends. Um, I had the best bosses, the best experiences. And if I hadn't sort of had faith in myself and been willing to be uncomfortable and cut, go backward to go forward, I never would have had that opportunity. And it was the best thing I ever did. The other piece of advice I have and the thing I learned is like, you really do need to get some street cred. So you need to spend some time learning before doing. So that was jobs like the next era job, going to Goldman Sachs, spending some time at Fortune. At, at different stages in my life, I have spent some time doing a job I'm not 100% in love with because I needed to learn something. Um, and I think there's two sort of mm, philosophies around that. One is that you don't know what you don't know. I think that holds true through your entire career, but especially when you're starting out, like you don't know yet what you don't know. So being able to spend some time learning um, is really important. And sometimes big companies offer a lot of opportunities for learning. Um, and sometimes those opportunities for learning come by joining a startup like Fast Company and taking an ill-defined job that maybe doesn't pay as well, but with like sort of the promise of it maybe becoming something wonderful. And sometimes you take those jobs and they are not okay. Um, but then you just get right quickly. That's another thing I learned, which is like, just if, if it's really not working for you, it's okay. Cause that tapestry is many, many threads and it doesn't need to be a single thread from like here to eternity, right? And the other thing is like that perspective matters in a career, particularly in business. Um, I think in marketing, especially, um, and in branding. So big companies with big budgets do things one way and small companies with no budget do things another way. But small companies are often selling to big companies. Big companies sometimes acquire small companies. Sometimes small companies become major market competitors for big companies. So if you are interested in a market or a job or a specific role, like say marketing, it's really valuable to work at all ends of the spectrum. So like you may know that you're like an entrepreneur at heart, but I would say, even if you're like coming out of Wells and you're like, I'm going to start my company, I'm going to do things, spend some time working in some big companies because it helps you understand like how are decisions made? How do they allocate their money? Like who is pulling the levers of power? And I think that that's really um, important. And then um, it's also like working, but like if you were going to, have a whole career in law, I would say maybe you spend some time working for both prosecution and defense. And I think it's the same in business. Like there's time spent in different sectors of the market. So as you begin to figure out what you're interested in, really looking at a market um, and an industry holistically and making sure you have experience around that industry is something I would definitely advise. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to say is like, you aren't, there's, there's no grades. Um, the only person your career needs to make sense to is you. And if you have a narrative story that matters, if you can find your monkey in your tapestry, that's all you need. Um, because there's no, like, nobody gets a gold seal. There's no, you know, attaboy at the end. Like, I, I just, nobody cares. Nobody cares what I did 10 years ago. I've been working for 30 years. And um, at this point, it's just stories and experience that matter. So you do you. And again, this is the, you know, saying I'm the monkey. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is that like enjoy the individual chapters of your career. And this is sort of back to the like, make sure you spend some time learning things. I think in my twenties, I came out and like, I even, I, I sent a letter not too long ago to my boss at Fast Company. I was such a pain in the ass when I worked at Fast Company because I was young and energetic and creative. And I was always like agitating for us to do more. And that's part of the beauty of youth. 
Um, and I think that there's time to do multiple chapters in a career. So you can spend a lot of time gaining uh, mastery in a certain sector or doing something. Like I spent a lot of time in publishing and then I sort of shifted over to entrepreneurship, starting my own companies. But I've also throughout my career, spent a lot of time in philanthropy. I worked at the Zayner Foundation. I was a strategic advisor to an organization called Women Moving Mil Millions. Um, which is organizations that donate at the million dollar plus level to advance the role of women and girls in the world. I got there through Jackie. I spent a lot of time there. And then I went on and I became a CASA, which is a court appointed special advocate for kids in the foster care system. And so that these are things I've done sort of throughout. And uh, the benefit of that is I've learned a lot about philanthropy. And while my day job, my work job is not necessarily running a nonprofit or doing anything like that. I have learned how to be very engaged philanthropically throughout my life. And that tap, my, my life professional tapestry is more than just the sort of named jobs. It's about the experiences that I've done. And for me, um, self-defense and philanthropy are two common threads that have are woven and inform my other work. So this is just a little math for you. So, um, you know, I graduated at 20, I'm 50 now. I'm a, I've been working for 30 years. Uh, there's a wealthy woman who lives in my building. She's 89. And I uh, went downstairs to talk to her the other day. And um, I asked her, we were just talking and she, I did not know this. At 60, she went back to school to become a lawyer. She started out of Wellesley. She worked at Harper's Bazaar and Vogue. And then she had kids. And then she decided her kids went off to college and she decided to become a lawyer at 60. And it's interesting because at 50, I know I still like have a whole nother chapters to write. Do you know what I mean? And um, so it's a very long working life if you remain engaged in the world. So you've got lots of time to try lots of things. Um, and sort of where you start is almost never where you end up. Um, that's just a fact of life. So I want to talk a little bit about brand you. This is something I feel very passionately about, particularly for women in business, but like sort of all people. And I, this is built on stuff that we do with some of our, our startup clients and our female founders, but I think it's really relevant for anyone. So at Fast Company wrote this article way back in the nineties called brand, the brand called you a uh, guy named Tom Peters wrote the article is one of those influential articles I ever wrote. And it's about thinking about yourself as a brand. Everything you do all the time, from the way you leave a voicemail message, to the way you sign your email, to the clothes you wear, to how early or late you show up to a meeting, to the ideas you bring to the table, how you follow through, how you work with others, that's your brand, right? So your brand is also a combination of you know, the roles you've had, the experience that you've gained. But a big part of sort of understanding your personal brand is knowing your why, like what gets you up every day? What gets you excited? Um, and then understanding your how, right? So what are your unique talents and attributes? What do you bring to the party? Um, and like sort of what is, what is the same about you wherever you go, independent of the role? That's sort of your why and your how. And then being able to articulate the unique attributes of you in really memorable ways. That's just like, feel free to think of yourself like a brand, right? Because um, products and stuff have catchy taglines, like you should have catchy taglines, you know, for yourself. Like I always describe myself as a blue sky thinker who's an um, expert at on the ground execution. And it's that combination of sky and ground to me that is really describes who I am. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And thinking beyond the title. So whatever title you have does not define you, whatever role you have, whatever you're paid to do, you are much more than that. Your whole brand is about a lot more than that. And you are always building your brand. Every interaction, what your LinkedIn looks like, how you follow up with everyone, that is your brand. And as you saw my earlier thing that I, I'm not like a like fanatical networker, because I'm actually kind of introverted and I don't like to go out and go to cocktail parties and do stuff like that. But I have maintained connections through my whole career that serve me so well. And part of that is just by being always engaged, always following up and sort of remembering 
people as I move from one place to the other and trying to bring them along with me. And sometimes just doing favors for people or looking out for them or throwing a job their way. That's all part of, of that. This is a little flywheel that um, is, goes a little bit deeper and I'll share this afterwards so people just take a look. It's the, the sort of the who, the why, the how, the what. Um, it's just a way to think about your elements of a personal brand like I was just talking about. And I think it's, it's just something to think about. Um, and so this is a redo of my slide earlier of who I am. My sort of personal brand, the thing, the language I use is being a brand builder is sort of my headline. I talk about myself as a blank space navigator um, and a blue sky thinker. So the one thing that's a common thread, my warp thread, what I've always been good at is I'm excellent in the blank space. So some people have trouble going into space when there's like um, nothing. This is comes into play with branding, new product development, marketing, like you're the idea person. You're the person who's like, has to come up with, what are we gonna call this thing? Or like, we need a new serve. And product is not just like, like a widget or a pen. It's like products or services or um, a new offering for your company or a new way of doing something. And so you have to be super creative to do that. Um, and sometimes that means you're sitting looking at a blank sheet of paper or you're with a group of people and you have to figure it out. So I always say that I'm a blue sky thinker, but an uh, execution expert. So I'm kind of good at the between. What I don't like, what I realized over my career, what I'm not great at is I am really good at beginnings and I'm pretty okay at endings. I get super bored with um, meetings. I don't like managing people. So I gravitated towards things that were like a lot of new ideation um because that's where I'm really good and so but some people love developing want a big team of people they love that kind of stuff so it's just good to know about yourself as you get into it how would you describe yourself this is my daughter I'm doing this just so you can see how I applied we applied the brand new she's applying to college right now so I made her do this exercise she's interested in engineering and the way we describe her is a seeker and a solver so she's you know she like is all about questions and answers and how does she get there? Um, she's very visual, sustained focus and consistency, asking questions to push for, push for understanding, being willing to be uncomfortable or underestimated. She's more quiet, sometimes sit in the background, but she gets where she's gonna go. So it's just a way of thinking about it through the lens of somebody much younger than, uh, than me. Like how would that, who, what, why, how apply to somebody younger? So here's some other little, quick five minute snippets of career advice. This is something I talk about with a lot of people, the balance between content control and compensation in your job, right? This is gonna, up. when I talked about my first job out of Wellesley, compensation was super important to me because I needed it to be. I had college debt to pay off. I had to live for myself. I had a car, I had food. Like I, was, I wasn't getting financial assistance for my family. I really needed to think about it. I was fully on my own. And so compensation became the big lever in me deciding that first job, right? The three elements in any job are what you get paid, um, sort of the content of what you do. Are you talking about washing machines all day or sneakers? Um, and then control. This is a sort of nuanced one, but it's, it is important. Like the, the flexibility that you have within your job, the ability you have to decide the content, um, so right now, I left corporate America because compensation is a little bit less important to me, but the ability to control my time once I had kids, when I made that jump from fortune to starting my own thing, it was because I wanted control over my time. Um, I got a little less control over content because I was doing project work for um, clients. So if a client came to me and it was like, can you write us this thing about wound care? Yeah, I got to write you. 500 words about wound care. Um, so I, I didn't, wasn't in the luxury of deciding the content, but the control made up for that. And I'm at a point now in my career where I get to have those things in balance. Um, and that's really nice, but that's also what we would call in the, in the marketing industry, you call that a luxury problem, which is like, you know, when you have all things, how do you decide the one thing? So that's just something to think about that content control compensation balance. Another piece of advice is when you're in a job, look up. If you don't want your boss's job, you might not need to spend too much time in that career, in that particular path. That happened to me at Fortune. I looked up the 
food chain and what my boss did all the time. And I was like, I so don't want that job. I didn't want my boss's job and I didn't want my boss's boss's job. And then I was like, I need to leave publishing. I, this is not where I want to be. And that sort of led me to kind of go in other places. So if you really aren't that interested in doing what your boss does, then it's just something to think about. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is like one size does not fit all. So every sort of niche industry and role. So if you're like a product manager and you go work for Procter and Gamble, um, and that's all, that's your dream. And your dream is to sort of climb that ladder, that type of career it's in marketing, but it has a defined career path. So you need to sort of understand the industry and uh, role nuances of the career that you're interested in. It is still going to be highly interconnected with the people you know, but it's just something to think about the nuances of your role. The other thing is um, different. There are different expectations based on the level you are as you advance in your career. So you know, what's expected of you when you're right out of school is different than when you're leading a team. And so that sort of gets into sort of decisions you might make. And then also another big piece of advice I have is to kind of constantly check in with yourself and have a personal comfort level with um, that content control compensation uh, rubric is really important to be honest. So Part of the reason I took the job at Goldman Sachs is I wanted to have a job that people were impressed by. And that sounds sort of like everybody's like, oh, I don't really need, you know, I just do it for the love of the work. But like, nah, I really wanted to know what it felt like to have a job that impressed people. I wanted an office with a door that closed. I wanted a business card that said, like, I wanted those things. Once I got them, I realized I didn't maybe want them as much as I thought I did. But you have to be sort of honest with yourself, per, this com, this portrays really very, very, very much to entrepreneurs. Um, there's a whole thing to say about that, about sort of deciding like, what do you want your company to be? Why are you, like, are you building it to sell it? Are you building it because you have a mission? Are you building it because you want to um, just like have a nice way to, you know, sustain your lifestyle? There's a lot of things there. So you have to be really honest with yourself sometimes about like why you're making the decisions that you're making. Um, one of the things I was asked is what did I get out of Wellesley and like, what did my specific, um, uh, major and things. And I thought a lot about it because like, I can promise you right now, like I had an area of focus on the civil war and the role of freed black women in the North after the civil war. And that does not come up that often in my day-to-day -day life. But what does come up a lot is communication skills, asking questions, writing. I do so much writing. My bet, my favorite professor at Wellesley was a woman named Anita Tien. I don't know if she's still teaching in the history department. I should probably know that, but I don't. Her comments on my, I took like four classes with her. She made me a much better writer and I will forever be grateful because writing became something I did so much. Critical analysis, really being able to like understand something and break it apart into what are the interconnected parts, um, making those connections and big leaps from one thing to another. American studies really did a lot of that because you were looking through threads through multiple disciplines and I do that a lot. And then being a problem solver, not a problem finder. I feel like this is a very Wellesley thing, which is like, when you see a problem, like come up with a solution and then be the problem, the person to help be, be part of the solution, not just finding the problems. I feel like that's a very Wellesley thing. And then I hope you do something great. Um, and that's how you get in touch with me. And I'll pause there so that I can um, answer any questions. Thank you. Wow. That was, that was fabulous. <laughs> there is so much there. There's a lot. There's a lot. And, and the, the slideshow was really beneficial. I love your chart of your career path, your career. Yeah, yeah. Path. Um, and the idea of it being a tapestry. Um, one thing that I will um, say to students before I ask you a question is um that sense of it being a tapestry and you said, you know, as you're weaving the tapestry, you have a sense of the threads, but you don't know what it's going to look like often while you're in it. And I will say one of the things um, that you said a bit later that I think should give 
people a sense of, because that's, that's uncomfortable to be like, oh, I'm doing all these things. And in the moment, I'm not entirely sure how it's all going to fit together. The, the thing that you said a bit later about, you know, you do you and you be honest with yourself about your kind of whys and those shift throughout your career. That sense of personal authenticity, you are being authentic to be thoughtful, to know yourself and to be honest with yourself about your needs and your goals at different stages in your career. That is your sense of comfort around not exactly knowing what the tapestry is always going to look like, right? Like if you are making choices that are authentic and reflect your own sense of values in any moment in time, like you you should know that the tapestry threads, yes. they're they're gonna they're gonna weave something that yes. matters to you. Um, exactly. That's because, exactly it. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about in terms of the work that you do now and maybe the work that you did at different stages, what brings you the most kind of joy or satisfaction in those roles? Um, that's a good question. I have done a lot of like highly collaborative work. And so I would say I really enjoy creative collaboration. My most satisfaction, it was incredibly satisfying to go from idea to concept to like a product I could hold in my hands when we did I Am Elemental. Um, I will say Julie and I no longer work together and we had a very contentious sort of um, separation of our working relationship. So that it was a harder experience um, and it made me a little gun shy for a while. But uh, today, I think the thing I get the most satisfaction from is sort of like, um, like finding a solution to something. So I do company and product naming now. I love the process of brainstorming a ton of names and then um, sort of presenting them to a client and and that that sort of back and forth that happens with someone. I get a lot of satisfaction from that. Um, and uh, so I, I really like it when um, you can kind of come to a, a new, an answer and create something that is new that didn't exist before. Um, good. And when you think about your current work in kind of branding and marketing, especially around naming, um, kind of twofold question, um, are there specific changes in this area that you see kind of as a result of where we are related to the pandemic? And are there kind of changes, shifts, like what are the kind of themes that you're seeing in this kind of kind of marketing work? Um, well, I think what happened with the pandemic, and I think this has happened for a lot of um, creative industries and businesses, is um, it really opened up even more so than it did to um, work with clients around the country and around the globe. So I pre-pandemic, I used to do a lot of meetings in New York, coffees, lunches, client development work. And my our network was a little, my business partner who worked for Apple for 10 years, she's on the West Coast and we we work by coastal. Um, and we used to sort of work in our, you know, do have clients that developed out of our connections. I think because of the pandemic, all of a sudden the rise of Zoom meetings and creative collaboration could take place electronically. So we didn't always have to be physically and that just opened up the possibility for a lot of people. So I think for that, and I, I know that's the case for a lot of small businesses um, and creative agencies and that sort of thing. So I think it's been a real positive. Um, I just don't have to travel as much as I used to even uh, leaving my house. People are more comfortable with that. The other thing um, I think that we're seeing where we are now is we do a lot of work in the tech space. Um, it's uh, a crowded space, uh, the URL space uh, it, and AI is sort of exploding. So I think there's just a lot of um, crowdedness in um, a, in certain market sectors um, that needs to shake out. And I think it, I've now that I'm older um, and I've been through a couple boom and bust cycles in markets, I've seen it. I think it's going to shake out a bit. Um, so that's, a, that's a pretty nuanced answer about something I see that's happening in my sector, but yeah. Um, 
I would love for us to have an opportunity to hear from any students who might have questions. Um, and you can feel free to um, either raise your hand or unmute and, and just speak up. What's on your mind? No. Hi, can I go first? Yeah, please do. Okay, sorry, is this working? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Leah. Cool, awesome. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for that amazing talk. It was so like great to hear from you and your perspective and your journey. Like, I've never thought about myself as like in terms of a brand and I can't wait to like do that exercise because I think it'll be, um, I personally love like self-reflection. I find it very rewarding and I think I can't wait to add this of my to my list of fun things to do to Oh yeah, we should do a brand new workshop sometime. That would be really fun. That would be so fun. I would <laughs> totally go to that. There's <laughs> often some if you kind of look into this, they're like Charles Sandberg wrote a piece about like why you're not a brand, why you're a human and there's been some interesting kind of um a little mm -hmm. bit pushback and when I think about that pushback, I always think that um in in some ways it comes from a little bit of a kind of a narrow way of thinking about like what it means to think of yourself as a brand. Like clearly you are a human, you are nuanced, you are complicated, you have all different layers and identities and parts. You are more than just a worker. You are all these things, right? But the idea of thinking about yourself as a brand, I think is a shortcut to understand how you communicate what you are and how you, first of all, how you think about, your, you know, how you reflect on your own about how you want to communicate who you are to whatever audience of people you're working with. And in the kind of professional world, that happens a lot. Like you're often asked mm -hmm. very um, kind of succinctly and with a bit of, you know, kind of pitch and flair, communicate what are you interested in? What are your experiences? What are your skills? What do you hope to learn and grow? Like that sense of, you know, the way that marketing work teaches us to kind of think about branding can be a really useful tool for how we present ourselves in a variety of different situations or environments. And it does not mean that you are equating your value to like a can of Coke. It's just a tool for reflection and really being um, thoughtful about how you're communicating, you know, where you are and what you hope to do. Um, Absolutely. After, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, thank you for saying that. I think I wish more people had like, especially younger people had these tools to add to their toolbox. That way they can start that process of figuring out like, what do I really want? What are my values that I prioritize? And uh, what, do I, what do I want to really define the next steps in my life? I feel like in my opinion, a lot of people would be more um, confident about making big decisions. Like, where am I going to go to college? Okay, now what am I going to study in college? Uh, I think it, even like career wise, like it would be easier to make those decisions and feel confident about it. So like, thank you so much for that. I can't wait to do that myself. Um, yeah, it's it's I, a bit yeah. too, I think. The one thing I want to say is like, you're sort of the, the uh, and that wheel is included and I'll send my presentation afterwards, which I know the presentation doesn't really mean anything because there's a bunch of just pictures in it, but the wheel, I can separate the wheel out. Um, it's a, it's the, the why and the how I think are the most important parts of that, which is the sort of like what motivates you. So um, I'll just use my daughter as an example because she's younger and we just had this conversation as she was thinking about where to apply to college and she decided to end up in engineering programs because we talked a lot about the idea of um, she really wanted to work on problems. She she wants to work on something that has a beginning, middle, and an end. So she liked the idea of sort of uh, defined work. Um, and I think there's that sort of, um, you know, and for me, I'm more of a, like a brand, a, I say I'm a brand builder would be my highlight. And, um, I think it's that why and then the how, which is like, what are, how do you approach things? Like, are you someone who listens? Are you a very thoughtful listener first? Are you best at like um, sort of visual or creative work? 
Are you best at analytics? And that sort of how are those unique attributes that are only to you? And it's like, also like, what are the things that people are always asking you to do? Are you the friend who's always doing? And that gets to the core of like who you are because you're going to approach your work the same uh, sort of independent. And some of those skills are built and learned, but some of it's also, you know, uh, the essence of how you approach thinking about your work and that relationship between the why and the how and the what can lead you into certain places. Um, and it will shift over time too. I think that's the other thing. It evolves, you know, so. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? More about co-mentorship, somebody said in the chat. So um, I just, I'll say just one second about co-mentorship. Um, it, it's something that um, I, it, it starts out when you first start working just as like your work friend, but we, uh, again, this is something that I think can happen um, either when you're part of a formal company, or if you're, it's very valuable when you're a solo entrepreneur and when you're working by yourself. Um, but it's a sort of structure and there's an article off follow up and send you a link destiny to the co-mentoring article that Sarah and I wrote because um, we're both Wellesley alums and we wrote it together. Um, the main thing is sort of setting a regular relationship, uh, like a regular set of meetings and that is short um, and that um, uh, uh, has, has a little bit of structure to it. And the goal is really to um, talk about work specifically and uh, it, whether it's exchange ideas or talk about problems that you're having and then like sort of a continuous thread over time. Um, I think it's also important when you're at this sort of the same level, a co-mentorship versus a mentorship mentorship where there's somebody who's like in a teacher role and somebody who's in a student role. Co-mentorship is really you're learning together and you're a sounding board. And the term I use a lot is thinking partner. So somebody that you're thinking through things with. Um, Sarah Leslie also um, did a similar yes. conversation. I know she told me we talked right before we were talking yeah. right before. Because, so um, yeah, all the students can just search um, for career conversations on our website and find a link to that conversation as well. Um, and she did mention the the kind of um, idea of co mentorship. Um, yeah, um, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'm mindful yeah. of time. I know that there's going to be a class block. Um, but I will send um, all the students um, your contact information in case students missed it. Um, and then also um, a link to the article and a link um, to the slide, um, because I think that it um, will be really great to have those resources on hand um, as you all you know, sort of begin to think about um, your why, your how, and that can apply to you know, career decisions beyond Wellesley, but also how do you want to spend your time in the summer? Or my, what might you kind of like to learn or skills you might like to, to, to develop through internships or other things, even while you're at, at Wellesley? Um, yeah. Obviously your coursework, all the things. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. I'm always happy to answer questions. So feel free to drop me an email. So thank you. Thanks to all the students. I'm glad that you were able yeah, to, to join us. Please reach out with any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Destiny. Thanks so much. Thank you.